The Edgar Claus. Hello, everyone, and welcome to what I hope you'll enjoy for the 14th of September, if it works on the 14th of September. I should point out that I started uploading the <coughs> video for the 13th of September. About an hour and a half ago, it's only 24 minutes long, and it has still not finished uploading. So, wish me luck. And we are continuing on the 19th Century Cruiser series, because they're cool, but they need to be talked about in concert. I need to think about them as an interwoven strategy of multiple strands of different developments going on. Technological. Political. Egotistical and egomaniacal. And cultural. Now, egomaniacal isn't just me being farcical. There are actually personalities involved in development of cruisers who are, by any defini definition of the uh, that you wish to use, Certainly trying to head towards being some sort of cartoonish villain. Luckily, with the Edgar class, they don't feature much. But still, the Edgar class are quite interesting in that whilst uh, most carry 10 6-inch guns and two 9.2-inch guns, some do have their forward 9.2-inch guns replaced by two 6-inch uh, guns. Basically, the debate of... Do we want the big status gun, or do we want to have more firepower at the ranges that we are likely to engage the enemy at? Always comes up. Hello, you taking over? Hello, Raleigh. Yes, I know. I know. There isn't a ship called Raleigh in this that you find upsetting. I know. But we will talk about other things. So the class includes the Crescent, the Grafton, the Edgar, the Hawk, the Inman, the Royal Arthur, the Gibraltar, the St George, and the Theseus. Now, the St George is an interesting name because. There aren't as many of those or as many Royal Arthurs as you think there are and think there should be. And St. George, one of the things that you realise is that this is the last class which has a ship named St. George in it. Like this is the last class which has a ship named Gibraltar in it. After all, the Malta class carry never gets built. And whilst there are many people who do think that there was likely to be saint names adopted for G3s or various other things, I am never quite so certain myself. The Royal Navy at that time was on a bit of an admiral kick, so I, I have a feeling they might have kicked with the kept with the admirals. You never know; they might have gone with the four patron saints. They might. There again, that sounds very, very Catholic, doesn't it? Although you know, you could get away with it if you go with the patron saints and nations, couldn't you? It's a whole, whole debate. Anyway, the Edgar class cruises. They are first class protected cruisers, which if you're not sure what it means, it basically means they are not armoured cruisers, but they have thick enough chunks of armour that if you gave them a proper belt and a few other things, uh, a belt, they would be first class armoured cruisers. And they would be very capable ships. And they're pretty capable ships as it is. As is, they're certainly ships which most powers do not want to fight and most powers do not want to engage in. They are ships which would give anyone a pretty much a run of them a run for their money, especially when you consider they have four torpedo tubes. But also, you have to remember something else about them because of their status, because of their capability, because of their crew size. They are also quite valuable ships to use, and this is a period where ships will often alternate between times of being commissioned or being in ordinary, i.e. reserve. And why do you keep ships in reserve? So they're available for when you need them in wartime. Now, that can seem kind of strange with the small fleets we're used to today, where we have barely enough to carry our peacetime commitments. But most navies at this time were readily able to make the case to their governments, we will need more ships in war than we need in peace. And rather than relying on these ships being built, and these ships being, you know, created and magically 
from, I don't know, some sort of phantom construction facility. They went, well, let's build some, and we'll build a few more ships than we need to keep our peacetime capability going, and our peacetime requirements, and some of the class we'll put in reserve, and some of them we'll put in, well, in, well, in, in service. And then, you know, when things come along, when those ships in the service have accidents, or when they need to be refitted, and they need to have a long and intense period of maintenance, that's not going to bother us, because we'll just pull one of the ships out of reserve, Maybe we'll pull it. Well, maybe we'll send it to refit before they go. Then the other ship that's in this commission goes in a refit. So when we we get a bra base a refitted brand new top of the range ship come into commission, while the other ship goes back and gets refitted and upgraded, and maybe that then goes into reserve, so we can preserve its ship hull life and its serving life. All these things were factors. So they have a top speed of twenty knots on twelve thousand indicated horsepower. Uh, when they have forced draft running, that is air being forced into the engines uh, to give them some more oxygen. And that gave them, as I said, top speed of 20 knots. And there was four double-ended cylindrical boilers feeding steam at 150 pounds per square inch for that. Supplying two free and the triple expansion engines driving two shafts. Now, they had a range theoretically of 10,000 nautical miles at 10 knots. Now, that's 10 nautical, 1,000 nautical miles at 10 knots. When they're going at yeah, a certain, how do I put this, dealing with a certain effort in terms of tides and currents, and, of course, 10,000 nautical miles at 10 knots when they are going in roughly a straight line to their, or as straight as you can go it, around the sort of world's oceans to get to their destination. Not zigzagging and not in a... Storm, uh, storm breeze and head on into a storm blowing against them. Those things all you make you use up fuel far more quickly. Can't think why. Now, whilst their armament of two 9.2 inch guns for most ships, one sitting on the stern for two ships, 10 quick firing 6 inch guns, 12 6 pounders and 4 torpedo tubes, is pretty decent. It's their armour which sets them apart as a first-class protected cruiser. They have between five and three inches of thick armour on their the armour deck, uh, which starts at waterline level and uh, level and arches up over the machinery spaces. They had casemates, which were six inches thick, which is sort of a high-level belt in a way if you think about it over certain spaces. Shields of three inches thick for the 9.2 inch guns, so don't get hit by anything too serious, but that's going to definitely provide you with splinter and concussion protection. And uh, a conning tower of 10 inches, which I know you're used to hearing me bash conning towers, and I do. But when you're engaging at long range and you need to see what's going on around you in order to be able to make an assessment, then there's no much, po no much point in the conning tower because you're not going to be in there. So it's a waste of metal. When you're engaging at ranges which pea shooter range should be safe for the, compared to um, the ranges they've been talking about, Model 1 and Model 2, then having a conning tower to shelter in, make your decisions in, probably makes sense. Although how much protection you're going to get from that conning tower, I do not know. How much protection do you think you're going to get from it? About as much as you get from your wool. Oh, that's fairly good. Keeps you warm, doesn't it? Right. HMS Edgar. Ah, oh, she's a good looking ship. She was launched in 18... Well, she was launched in 1819. And we think she's sort of commissioned, but not commissioned. She's put in ordinary in about 1892, 1893. There is a debate about that. And when I say there's a debate about that, there's a debate about it because, well, she costs a fair chunk of money. And she's completed in March 1893, but she's not, doesn't seem to be commissioned much other than for exercises till 1900 when it's there's some discussions. She was commissioned in 1900, uh, we know, and that was to actually take the relief crews out to Aldrin, Phoenix, Waterwitch, and Robin 
four different ships, two sleeps, a service vessel, and a service steamer, a river service steamer, uh, to Hong Kong. Again, a post which cruisers and especially protected cruisers are often used for. Uh, it's a it's quite a good role. You can send out a ship which provides status as it moves around. It can be quite impressive, turning up, and it sort of provides a sort of boost of presence. Oh look! Oh, there's another ship we we haven't seen that one before. Turns up, delivers the cruise. It has the space for the cruise as well, and it looks like it's stuffed with personnel while they're going out there. So it, you know, it's not just carrying its own crew, but it's carrying the crews for Aldrin, Phoenix, Waterwitch, Robin. It calls at Gibraltar, Malta, Aden, Colombo, and Singapore, and before arriving at Hong Kong. In 1902, she has her tubes, her boiler tubes, uh, retubed uh, due to defects, and then takes part in the coronation review in August 92. And then is, she is commissioned to relieve Anyman, her sister, which is also serving, uh, which is serving on the China station. She's damaged by an Austro-Hungarian submarine during uh, World, uh, during World War One on 4th April 1918 near, well, in Mediterranean, and, but she's okay. And it's, she's actually sold for breaking up in 1921 and arrives in Morecambe in 20, April 1923 for actual breaking up. So gets sold for it, but doesn't get broken up for another two years. HMS Hawk, well, she's of course one of the class which is actually sunk. If we consider Nine are completed and one is lost. Eight are eventually scrapped. Hawk is the one lost. And she is lost to a submarine. She's actually lost to U9, which was the submarine which had already sunk three cruisers already in one day in World War One. So sinking Hawk as well is kind of being greedy. But no, Hawk had had an interesting career. She was deployed to the Mediterranean fleet on commissioning. Again, some go into reserve, some go straight into service. And that's pretty much the case with, um, with Hawk, because she's completed in May 1893, and very quickly after that does she find herself with the Mediterranean fleet. She remained with the Mediterranean fleet for uh, most of the 1890s. In 1897, she takes part in the International Squadron, which I've talked about before in previous videos. A certain Russian cruiser took part in the International Squadron as well. And at one point, she's actually part of the force which is um, uh, carrying the Greek Expeditionary Force, uh, transporting it to Greece. She was recommissioned again in February 1902. It was under orders to prepare to go to the Cape of Good Hope station, rather like Ed Cahan, carrying, uh, carrying personnel. And this was for uh, crews down there, of course. She was decommissioned in April under Captain Algernon Horatio Anson. Now, she left Chatham in pretty much the second week, uh, second week of April and took the cruise for Forte, Dwarf and Partridge down to Simonstown. Uh, she arrived on 10th of May, left on 20th of May, stopped at St. Helena, Ascension, Sierra Leone, Las Palmas, Madeira on the way back before arriving at Plymouth on the 16th of June. Now, at this point, Algernon Horatio Anson was supposed to be replaced. He was supposed to be replaced by Julian Charles Alex Wilkinson. However, Algernon is still aboard, in command, when she takes part in the Spithead Review on the 16th of August 1902. For the coronation of King Edward VII. So, here is the question, and probably I think it's question one that's going in this video, because I'm doing two. This question is this Can you think of a more naval name than Algernon Horatio Anson? Seriously, can you think of a name which is more naval than Algernon Horatio Anson? And it doesn't seem to matter where I place this camera. I, my eyes always seem to be looking out of the screen. I'm not sure what it is at the But I think it's probably because I'm trying to combine everything onto one screen. But this is a question. So apologies for that if my eyes are constantly looking off. Can you think of a name which would be more naval? It can be for any navy. 
It's got to be maximum of three, uh, three words, so you can't go Jervis, Collingwood, Nelson, da, 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 da. Maximum three. More Nelson. More of a... How do I put this? Naming someone to make them become something. I know there's an actual phrase for it, but I cannot remember off the top of my head. Than Algernon Horatio Anson. Can you think of anything more life-fitting name than that? Thank you very much. And now she carried on doing those duties, wandering around various stations, but mainly Mediterranean for most of that period. She, in 1911, under the command of Commander W.F. Blunt, um, collided with the RMS Olympic as well. That's her first claim to fame. Not only was she the only one of the class sunk in World War, uh, sunk and sunk by a vessel which had already sunk three submarines in a day, she had actually managed to lose her bow, which is why she ended up with a straight bow. In a collision with Olympic. Olympic lost most of her stern. It was not nice. And much worse for the uh, White Star Line was they lost not only the trial, they lost on appeal as well. Yeah, it turned out the Royal Navy had fairly good navigators who were able to show exactly where they were and what they were doing. Does make a difference. She was part of 10th Cruiser Squadron when she was sunk in 1914. Uh, the vessels which go, the four of them which end up going to Gallipoli, they get torpedo bulges and all sorts of things. And it's the basis often for my arguments, which I'll discuss later, about how you could have modified ships to push through the minefields. The ships which are on the 10th Cruiser Patrol in North Sea as part of the sort of the blockade don't have those fittings and Hawk is racing to get to station after having stopped to pick up mail from Enderman, one of her sister ships. She's not zigzagging. There is an unsuccessful successful attack on Theseus and that tells everyone there's submarines in the area which is then they start ordering the ships to go and move north and to keep zigzagging and that when they don't get a response from Hawk that's when they know that she's been hit. And disturbing enough there are only 70 survivors from the ship. The rest of the crew, roughly 524 officers and men, die. This includes the ship's captain. Because when she's hit, she goes straight down. She's hit by a single torpedo. And quickly capsizes because of where that torpedo hits. And... Again, if you go through it, you're sort of thinking, well, hang on, these ships are built in torpedo era. They're built in the torpedo area where torpedoes are not really that accurate and usually launched from close range by surface ships. Submarines are still coming along, still kind of toyish at the beginning of the 1890s. They become more viable as you get in the 1900s. And 20 years later, submarines are very different than the submarines you're dealing with in the 1890s. And this affects their design and their compartmentalization. But also, what I'm suspicious of is that she had capsized quite so quickly. Potentially, that suggests to me that there were doors and things open inside her. Something to allow the water to move around the ship far more quickly than it was supposed to. And far more quickly than it was supposed to. Ah, uh, Endymon. Now, with Endymon, I have a small confession to make. It's one of my favourite names that a Royal Navy ship can get. And I am continually upset that there have been more of them. And like with Edgar, there is a well-known thing that if the Enderman had, if the E-Class had had more vessels, the E-Class cruisers built in the 1920s, or completed in the 1920s, had had more vessels, Enderman and Edgar would have made a return. So here is my second question for today. If you were to pick any other E-class, any other names for E-class, what would they be? If you're going, you're basically, that class was theoretically supposed to be, have the same run as the D-class. 
So it was basically going to be first-rate light cruisers, second-rate light cruisers, third-rate light cruisers with the C-Class. Sort of broadly speaking. With the Hawkins class being these sort of large light cruisers. Don't get me started on that one. Anyway, as these went on, you'd probably seen more use of the twin six inch turret, and they'd probably evolved into something which would be very similar to a Leander in layout. But anyway, leaving that to one side, Enderman. That was first used in 1779 as a 44-gun Robot class fifth rate frigate. Had been a 1797, the lead ship of the Enderman class frigates, um, one of which HMS Enderman, of course, herself fought a duel with USS President on the 15th of January 1815 and disabled the American ship. Cruelty of her. Uh, she'd been a screw frigate launched in 1865, and the last vessel to carry this name was this one of the Ego class in 1891. So I'd like you to look through the Royal Navy history, if you'd like it to, and pick out E-names for the rest of the class from the two E-class vessel uh, cruisers forward. I would, of course, put Endyman and Edgar as two of those names, but it, I leave it up to you whether you include them or not. And let's talk about Endyman of 1891, but I'm going to reset the slide timer. Yes. That's what I'm doing when I do that. I'm resetting the timer. I know it, it gives me, I set it up to give me 200 seconds per slide. I know when I'm roughly reaching a point at which I need to start making things work. Now, she was launched in 1891. And, well, we know she gets activated fairly quickly because she goes out to the China station. And, well, if you have just spent roughly, and I say this is in the nicest possible way, roughly 350,459 pounds on a ship, and that's according to the Brassies Naval Annual in 1895, you're going to want to get some use out of this vessel. Admittedly, some of the use of these vessels is going to be in reserve for if there's a big war and you need to go and really lay down the lumber in commerce interdiction and commerce protection may, um, criteria or provide reconnaissance for the matter a battle fleet that's what really first class protector crews are about laying down the lumber where you need it well she goes out to take part in the china station working on there, and it took part in actually suppressing the Boxer Rebellion. At that time, she had uh, a future VC and Rear Admiral uh, winner, Eric Gascoigne Robinson aboard her. She did some great naval diplomacy, uh, went to see Manila in December 1901, where she met the governor and many US officers, uh, which was good because many of those US, U.S. officers had served alongside officers from Endymion and crew from Endymion during the, the suppressing of the Boxer Rebellion. So they had good relations. Then she returned home for the uh, uh, coronation review of Edward VII, paid off at Chatham in 1902, and she's placed in the Sea Division of the Medway Fleet Reserve. She was then flagship of the uh, uh, flagship in Cork Harbour in 1914. And she's one of the four ships sent to Gallipoli. Now, as said earlier, what happens to those ships when they go to Gallipoli? Well, it's quite interesting. They're fitted with these very cool torpedo bulges to protect from torpedo attack. And we know they work, and I'll talk about how we know they work later on. But they reduce the speed by four knots. So they go from having a top speed of 20 knots to a top speed of 16 knots. Now, this is problematic, but not impossible to deal with. And it's where I often base my idea and explanation of, if I wanted to really run the minefields at the Straits of Dardanelles, what I would have done would be took a load of these older protected cruisers, some of the pre-dreadnought battleships, fitted them with massive bulges, filled in front compartments with cork 
or other buoyant material. Anything I could put in there that was preferably low on flammability, low on flammability, high on giving me some, uh, giving me buoyance, giving me capability. Sealed up those compartments, welded them, riveted them, whatever I need to do, make them as airtight as I could do, and then blast my way through the minefield with ships which, if they're no longer floating at the end, as long as the crews have got off, I don't care. They're old ships, but I can blast my way through to Constantinople that way, or Istanbul. And if I can get through to get through there, then I've won. If you consider how close the fleet got with the ships it had designed, which were not designed to be sacrificed or theorized about sacrificing, if you had some ships that you were less worried about sacrificing to put at the front to do the initial push through, that fleet could have actually done it and forced the Straits of Dardanelles, and that could have had an interesting impact on World War One. Do I think it would have changed the timeline or the ultimate or the ultimate result? No, and no. Um, but I think it could have led to definitely the war in the Middle East not taking place, Dardanelles being very different, and possibly actually those troops which end up fighting in the Middle East, etc., could have ended up being sent to Russia to back up the help the Russians. Or could have gone to the Western Front. Anyway, would have been a very interesting history. Now, why is Earl's shipbuilding here mentioned? And why do I have a very interesting, but ultimately, Chilean ironclad, the Blanco and, and Clada here? Because Earl's shipbuilding are who build a couple of the Edgar-class cruisers. They build Edmund and St. George. And they're well-built ships. Earl's shipbuilding does good work. They are based in Hull of East Riding, Yorkshire. They are very nice ship, shipbuilders. But what they are also is in a difficult position because they are not the biggest of yards. They are not the smallest of yards. They are too large to be able to get by focusing on building small fry, i.e. small freighters, small merchant ships, fishing boats. They are not big enough in terms of name and well-known to get enough of the large ship orders that you need to really sustain the company. Which is why they have the consistent economical issues they do. But they're a good company and they build good quality ships. So if you see a ship that's built by them, some of them are still wandering around to this day. And they were well-built ships. HMS Royal Arthur. Now that's a name you don't hear that all often. In fact, this is the only ship to have carried that name other than a land station, which was a Royal Navy stone frigate, which was set up in World War II. Uh, but I think, well, its second iteration did last on 1993, if I'm not mistaken. But no, Royal Arthur, along with her sister ship Crescent, were the two vessels built to that slightly modified design. And given those two six in extra six inch guns instead of the forward 9.2 inch gun but considering how many variants variations you get across the class anyway because of the differences in building practice at this time and the engine construction that this the fact that the class itself two of the ships have elder built engines uh one ha one has an earl three have mortally including royal arthur but then there's Napier build Gibraltar's engines, Humphreys build Grafton's engines, Penn build Crescent's engines. So there you go. Uh, how can Royal Arthur and Crescent be the same subclass if they've got engines built by completely different manufacturers? It's fun times. It is fun times. But no. Uh, she was laid down in 1890, launched in 1891, and sold her breaking up in August 1921. She was sent out to serve as flagship Pacific Station from 1893 to 1896. She then refitted in Portsmouth in 1897 and then sent out to serve as flagship of the Australia Station from 1897 to 1904. 
it was during this role that she provided one of the two uh, escorts for the royal yacht of fear carrying the duke then the duke and duchess of cornwall and york uh, the future king george v and queen mary to australia to open the federal parliament in 1901 she visited Norfolk Island in 1902 and Suva, Fiji the following month. Um, she was flagship, often under command of Vice Admiral Al Alpha Dalrymple Fanshaw at one point and on the Australian station. In, she's recommissioned in 1905, serves on the North American West Indies station before returning to England in 1906 laid up in reserve for three years, and then is served as part of the Home Fleet and later Queenstown Training Squadrons. She's guard ship and scarper flow for the early part of the First World War, and later is the submarine depot. And using her as a depot ship makes a lot of sense, because if you're sending her to scarper flow, well, that's a place where you do not have a lot of infrastructure. So if you use a cruiser as your depot ship, that is a quite a good build already. It's got all the protections, it's got all the facilities you need for storing ammunition and dangerous materials it's got all the food it's got all the electrics it's got all the hydraulic generations all the stuff you need for a depot ship to have it already has plus the combination and if you're using it in places which are less secure than scarf flow if you send a cruiser which has been turned into a depot ship they tend to keep some of their guns which are quite useful for if you're dealing with how do i put this pushy neighbors or locals who are in the pay of pushy neighbors who decide they want to try and get aboard your depot ship um, in the middle of a rather convenient riot. Uh, it's rather helpful to have some rather large mm, guns to point in their direction and go, excuse me, you can fit your entire upper arm inside this barrel. Imagine what the size of the shell is that comes out of it. It's not nice. It's not how we prefer to manage things these days and it's not even how they prefer to manage things those days but it was useful as something which was an extra layer of security for a long-range deployed depot ship hms gibraltar and again this is one of those names you think would come up far more often than it does and unfortunately the last one to be called the plan to be called gibraltar was the second i think of the malta class aircraft carriers and yeah other than that this was the last ship to be called gibraltar and last one built previous vessels had been a 20 ship uh, a 20 gun sick freight which was commanded by john bing the one who was executed in the opening of the seven years war um, there was a, another 20 gun six rate and a 14 gun brig, and then an 80 gun Spanish vessel was that was captured at the Battle of Cape St. Vincent, was renamed Gibraltar. Can't think why then. And then a 101 gun screw first rate launched in 1860 was called Gibraltar. And then there's this vessel. These are the sum of HMS Gibraltars that have served. It's a name which should come again. Now, her career, you would think with her name being Gibraltar, she would have been a shoo-in for the Mediterranean station. And actually, no, she spends most of the time on the Cape station. <laughs> That's where she spends most of the time, uh, wandering around Africa and being a big part of the presence there. Um, she takes part in the visit to Zanzibar following the death of the Sultan and the accession of his son, Ali bin Hamad. Um, she is the flagship of Rear Admiral Arthur Moore, who was the Commander-in-Chief of the Cape Station. Again, a good post for her to be there. Two of her six-inch guns were dismounted to be used um, on Swarvak's head on Vermont 3. Um, that looks, well, basically as part of the, the defence of those islands in the Shetland. And as a midshipman, the future first sea lord, John Cunningham, no relative to no relation to Andrew Cunningham, but who succeeded after him as first sea lord, um, served aboard her. You can go and see those guns, although I do think um, one of them has had its breech mechanisms removed. I think both of them actually might now have had their breech mechanisms removed. I'm sure when my dad was there a long time ago, he said one of them didn't and one of them did. 
have it, but I think now that both of them have lost it. Now, in terms of armor, she actually had also between two and seven inches of armor on the, around the ammunition hoist. And this is something which I'm not sure whether it was class or all, all the class had it. And she's listed as having 12 inches for her conning tower. I think there were modifications as the class went on and were built. I think some of them had those stats I gave at the beginning were very much the stats for the first ships and ships as originally designed. But as I read the books, you can either call it a class of 12 individual ships or a class, uh, you can call it a class with modifications. And I think Gibraltar has had some more modifications than others in terms of having more armor fitted. Grafton. HMS Grafton has an interesting career. She's built in Thames Ironworks, a shipbuilding company. She's laid down in January 1890, launched 1892, and is commissioned first in September 1895 in Portsmouth. Now she's sent off to the China Sea, to the China Station. And once she's there, she serves out there until 1899. Then she returns home for refit. In December 1901, she's ordered to relieve Warspite as flagship on the Pacific Station. Now that is Warspite, of course, of Imperius class fame, which I've talked about before in a previous video of this series. She's commissioned under Ca at Chatham by Captain John Locke Marks. Now, as well as possibly having a philosophical event, uh, uh, <clears throat> as well as possibly having a philosophical bent, considering that name. Let's be honest, the captain called Marks in the Royal Navy. Oof. I just imagine the stick he got as a junior officer. Uh, 14th January 1902, with a complement of 571 officers and men. And they left, and when they got to Valaprita in mid-March, Rear Admiral Bickford, the flag com uh, commander in chief Pacific Station, hoisted his flag on Gra Grafton a couple of days later. However, he decided he wanted to keep Captain Colin Richard Keppel as his flag captain, so he transferred Keppel to Garafton and Marks back to Warspite, and Marks took Warspite home. <sighs> Poor Marks. Now, after this, Grafton takes part in what you have to do before there is things like the World Bank and the United Nations and all those other options we have today. In 1902, Grafton lands two parties of fully armed sailors at San Jose in Guatemala. This is to suppress the revolutionary disturbance uh, there, and that disturbance has been caused by you, the UK going, um, we need you to repay the loan you took out from us. Now, the show of force does actually get the government to pay, but it is often used as an example of gunboat diplomacy, and really it's not. Well, it is. But it's also not the kind of gunboat diplomacy you'd normally think about. In that, today we take it for granted when we're talking about these things, and sometimes when I hear people talking about international relations, we take the international structures which we have in existence for granted. They are there, they are wonderful, we have them, they allow us to do everything so peacefully, so nicely organised. There are all sorts of uh, things which sovereign states subject themselves to and agree to be part of and agree to be bound by. I agree to have a limitation on their sovereignty. But even now, theoretically, if a sovereign state refused to pay its debts, the option to a government is well, either their own taxpayers have to absorb that debt. It doesn't matter if you write it off or anything. If you, Even if you write off and go, right, then I'm going to forget that debt, that money still has to come from somewhere. You Writing off a, date, a debt doesn't make the money disappear. The money, the, the British government, to get that money to loan, might well have taken out a loan from a bank itself, because it doesn't have any money to begin with. So it still has to pay back that loan which means the British taxpayers have to pay back that money. So you can do that, but that's not going to be very popular with the only public. So the other option is, what, declare war to try and get it? In this case, it's a show of force, because they didn't have the World Bank. They didn't have all the other systems they could go to. Now, she served for quite a while out there and did very well. 
However, by the outbreak of First World, of First World War, she is with 10th Cruiser Squadron. Seems to be mostly Edgar class with 10th Cruiser Squadron, isn't it? And now, eventually they decide the Edgar class aren't really suitable for blockade work in the North Sea. Mostly they're worried about older cruisers and submarines. And so she loses her 9.2 inch guns to go to M23 and M28, those two lovely monitors, which I do have a whole series about Royal Navy monitors, which I produced last Christmas. And I think it ends with M33, the last surviving vessel. It was decided, therefore, that they would find use for them. Unfortunately, after they'd taken the 9.2 inch guns off them for the monitors, they then suddenly decide, hang on, what would be really useful for these ships is to go to Gallipoli. And they're going to refit them for British War Island operations. And this is where they decide to fit two more 6 inch guns to replace the 9.2 inch guns, which have been removed. Plus, they get anti-torpedo bulges. Now, all this work reduces the top the ship's top speed by four knots. But those bulges do work. How do I know they work? I've said they work earlier. Well, they work because in June 1917, she's torpedoed by the German vessel UB-43, 150 nautical miles east of Malta. The bulges limit the damage, allow her to safely be brought into Malta under her own power with no casualties. And this is where I start off with my point often I make about Gallipoli. If you can take an armoured cruiser, not even an armoured cruiser, a first class protected cruiser, and you can give it bulges sufficient that torpedo strikes are going to do minimal damage, and if we consider other vessels which have been hit by such things have been sunk, well then surely you can do something else for it. Surely you can turn these ships, and especially if you're talking about pre dreadnought battleships, which have greater subdivision and even more armour, into things which can, with the right bulges and with the compartments maybe filled up with cork and sealed, either riveted shut or maybe, well, you've got some early welding going around at this point, uh, various things, you know, stop farther forward, you could have used them to push through the minefield at Gallipoli. The idea would be you turned up much as you did when the, Royal Navy, when the Navy's tried to force it, where they almost forced it the first time. But you turn up those ships, you turn up prepared. The landing parties aboard, the ships which aren't supposed to go at the front, because you really don't want to load down too much with too many people on ships, which are basically one-way minesweepers. You have the minesweepers that you were going to send in the front, go in the front, but you also have these ships come along. And basically they just keep going. And their purpose is to set off the mines and clear the channel, if necessary, by themselves setting off the mines and just keeping on going. And these are ships which would be old, hopefully volunteer-based crews, but they would be sort of have a minimal the minimal crew you could put on to get them through. So minimal number of people risked. But you can make your path. And that could have worked. It's as if the Royal Navy, even after Jackie Fisher had worked his magic, was that short of all the ships they could have done this with. Especially with all the building efforts they'd been doing prior to World War One. Anyway, HMS St. George. Again, you'd expect far more ships to be named St. George than there were, but there really weren't. It's quite disturbing. There's been a 60-gun ship built in 1622. Uh, there was a ship captured in 1626, uh, which was called St. George. There was a 96-gun first-rate launched in 1668 as HMS Charles and renamed in 1687. Can't think why she was renamed in 1687. And then there was a Hulk, which was bought from M. Stevens and then was used as a foundation of a Chatham dockyard. And uh, yeah, here is something for inflation for you and gun inflation. In 1668, 96 guns is a first rate. In 1785, less than 100 years later, less than 100 years later, 98 guns is a second rate. Yeah. 
that's gun inflation for you. That's before they even come up with capitalism or any of the modern economic theories. There you go, gun inflation. It's terrible, terrible. I blame the gunsmiths. I really do. I blame the foundries. Why else would, you know, 96 guns have been a first rate in 1668 and now it's 98 guns as a second rate in 1785. It's just, you know, cruelty. Um, then there was the HMS St. George, which was originally ordered as Britannia in 1762, renamed Princess Royal in 1812, uh, St. George, uh, renamed St. George a few days later, and then called Barfleur in 1819. So basically was the naming Olympics vessel. Uh, in 1840, 120-gun uh, first rate. So there you go. By 1840, though, first rate, 120 guns. Hmm. So that meant that a first rate, you know, had gone up by 24 guns or 25% in 100 and, well, no, 214 years. No. Sorry, I was doing that from 1626. Uh, in a hundred and... Ooh. That's 28 off that. 172 years? Roughly? Hundred and seventy two years gone up by twenty five percent. There you go, more gun inflation. And in eighteen ninety two it's this. And you can see her nine point two inch gun clearly on the front of the deck. You can see the line out of six inch guns. You can see the firepower these ships had built into them. And the fact that you had the six inch guns below and the six inch guns above. And I think the six inch guns above have the same shielding as the 9.2 inch gun, from what I understand. And so then you have the casemate guns below, which have got six inches of armor going. <laughs> and that arm belt actually does go quite high up on the ship. So it does give some protection to the guns higher up as well. They, they've learnt, they've learnt. Anyway, St. George took part in the 40 minute long Anglo Zanzibar War in 1896. Now, I'm not sure if this qualifies as the shortest war in history, but that's question three of today. Is there a war shorter than the 40 minute long Anglo Zanzibar War that actually involves a declaration of war and actually involves some actual fighting, other than just an administration and people going, we're at war, and the other side going, we surrender now? Because I'm honestly not sure if you can run a war in less than 40 minutes. I think that would be a very frenetic effort to make a whole war last less than 40 minutes. Uh, HHS Glasgow of Zanzibar, I wonder where that vessel started off life, uh, a yacht, armed yacht, um, fired upon the British flotilla led by St. George that also comprised of Philomel, Raccoon, Sparrow and Frush. Okay, so that is a first class protected cruiser, a pearl class cruiser, an Archer class torpedo cruiser, a Red Breast class gunboat, well, two Red Breast class gunboats. Why did I have Frush not? Why was that open page bit? My own notes are scaring me. And in response to this, um, well, the response of the British flotilla firing back on Glasgow, because so she was taking on five ships, bravely, an armed yacht, an obsolete armed yacht, I think is the nicest way to put it. And I, I did take that phrase from Wikipedia and other articles in other books, etc. They have gone from, well, let's put it this way, worse words than obsolete to describe it. Barely functional appeared in one academic paper. Um, for want of a better phrase, armed yacht <laughs> it was in another paper it's not really a nice description of poor glasgow and um yeah she sunk with a hole below the waterline because of the returning of fire and the union jack is raised over the sinking yacht in surrender and the flotilla launches lifeboats to rescue the crew of the glasgow and that pretty much ends the war 
although she, Glasgow did lie at the bottom of Zanzibar town until 1912. Uh, but no, St George then went back and served the Channel Fleet, and in 1901 she's one of the other escort no, vessels had chosen to escort the Royal Yacht Ophir. And that's the point. The Ophir is law, which is carrying the Duke and Duchess of Cornwall in York. Future King George V and Queen Mary, as I've already mentioned, is escorted around the world and on duties by two Edgar class cruisers. The Royal Navy can pick whichever cruisers it wants for that mission. It's going to pick ships which look good. It's going to pick ships which can keep up with the Royal Yacht, which have the range to do what it needs to do. And most importantly, have very good crews aboard who they can rely to do or whatever is necessary to keep that yacht out of trouble. The raw, it, it, it's kind of like when I'm talking about 10th destroyer flotilla in World War II. And what the, the, the Royal Navy, the Allies, forming them for defense of the channel. There are few missions which carry high enough uh, as high a priority as that did which in other words means they can get whatever ships they want they will pick the best ships for that duty bar none there is no qualms of but that's expensive or that will cost this or or or, or that we could be using that elsewhere or this there is nothing going to come up there's going to be a case of what do you want that is what you will get. And it's the same in this period, definitely much in the 1900s, etc., of escorting the Royal Yacht. Even, and this is something which Britain has to consider now, and I think that might be one of the reasons why the Royal Yacht Project is, or National Flagship Project, is currently um, stalled a bit, is the reality that if you have one of those, you need to make sure you have ships in the water which can escort it with sufficient status. Now, that used to be, a while back, the job of a Type 22 frigate. Now, the Type 22 frigate was the first-rate frigate the Royal Navy had. They occasionally would use Leander-class frigates as well, and other vessels, but they would tend to be used in multiples. When you only had a single available, it was a Type 22, which was found. Nowadays, you're looking for a general purpose asset, in which case you'll probably be talking about a Type 26 frigate, would have to be assigned to the duty. And the trouble is, we're only technically supposed to be building eight of those. And if you add on escorting Royal Yacht to those duties, that's de facto, or national flagship, whatever we want to call it, that's de facto a ninth one you need to match up with it. Probably a ninth and a tenth to guarantee you have the availability of ships. And honestly, at that point, it becomes a case of why are we not building another full batch? Because we're building a batch of three, and then we're building a batch of five. So you might as well build a batch of four. Or potentially a batch of six. Depending on what you want to do with them. But no. St. George has an interesting career and gets up to quite a lot. Uh, she takes part in the fleet review at Spithead for the Edward VII's coronation. And she's the flagship of the Cape and West Africa station under Rear Admiral Henry, Harry, Swan, Harry Rawson um, at the, in the First World War. She's designated a depot ship in 1919 and sold for breaking up at Plymouth in July 1920. Right. Theseus, Theseus, because you can't just have the Minotaur, you have to have Theseus as well. And, well, she's built by Thames Iron Work and Shipbuilding Company, which we've discussed before. She's a good ship. She has a very interesting career. Upon commission in 1896, she's part of the Special Flying Squadron. Now, this force was formed up roughly three times in this history. No. And this time, in this occasion, 1896, is formed up in response to the war scare of Germany. And then she's deployed to the Mediterranean fleet. She proceeds from the Mediterranean in 1897 to join Harry Rawson's fleet that had been sent to, that had been reinforced in West Africa. It was already down there, 
for a punitive expedition against Benin. Uh, they assembled off Benin by the 3rd of February, and landings took place on 9th of February. However, malaria breaks out in a lot of ships used. And as a result, when she comes home to be freed to fit in Chatham later that year, she goes through an incredibly thorough disinfection. This is again the Royal Navy showing what they're doing what the Royal Navy does. We clean our ships. That's a Royal Navy motto. And the reason for it is the Royal Navy likes to be able to deploy their ships around the world. And the trouble is they can go to those places and they can bring back interesting and in interesting and intriguing objects and diseases. And those diseases can run rampant amongst crew. And in malaria, for example, you have lots of standing water aboard a ship. You always will have lots of standing water aboard a ship because it's surrounded by water the whole frigging time. So this means that usually you have to be quite careful about where it's gone and what's got into it. Salt water isn't necessarily the best for mosquitoes, etc., and spreading malaria, but it's not also the worst depending on how diluted it is. When war broke out in 1914, Theseus joined the 10th Cruiser Squadron, as I mentioned earlier. And she was actually in late August when Russian forces in the Baltic captured copies of Germany at Coburg. At Coburg. It's Theseus, which is dispatched from Scarborough flow to Alexandrovsk in order to collect the copies offered to the British. She arrived on 7th September, didn't manage to depart until the 30th of September, and returned to Scarpa with two Russian couriers and documents on 10th October. They were firmly handed over to Winston Churchill, who was the First Lord, the 13th of October, and subsequently were, of course, given to Room 40, who went, whoopee and were very, very happy. On the 15th of October, she's back out at sea, and she's on patrol off the coast of Aberdeen. And, as mentioned, this has been already discussed in the previous, uh, previous you know, uh, the fate of Hawke. Theseus was unsuccessfully attacked by the German submarine U-17. She was zigzagging. And I should point out, whilst U-9 does have the success that she does and ha that has sank the sink four cruisers, etc., this class, I've gone through their various histories and I can get it to about 20 attempted attacks at various points by submarines of the Germans and the Austrian navies. Only one of them's lost. So yeah, submarines are a powerful and scary tool. And yes, U-9 is an absolute demon. But it's not necessarily the one-way street it's sometimes portrayed as being in popular culture. Um, she goes through, Theseus goes through to Darnell's campaign and... Then eventually, in 1919, she becomes a depot ship, and then she's deployed into the Black Sea, where, again, it's useful to take a depot ship which is armed with you, and armoured, just in case things go wrong. It's useful when you're dealing with interesting circumstances to have that ability. Now, HMS Crescent is the last of the class to be built, and she's commissioned at the... Uh, her first commission is at the Australia Station. Um, she goes there, out there, under the command of Captain Abuffnot. And she's the vice, uh, the flagship of Vice Admiral Sir Frederick Bedford, Commander in Chief of North American West Indies Station in, from 1899 until 1902. She has a pretty darn interesting career, including at one point going and rescuing um, HMS Hermes, a high flyer class protected cruiser, when um, she's mm, broke, uh, has a broken shaft. When Bedford was succeeded as Commander-in-Chief of the station in July 1902, he let, went home with HMS Crescent. And she was succeeded on station as flagship by HMS Ariane. Uh, arriving at Spithead on 24th of July, her commission was prolonged. She could take part in the fleet review. And then, well, she's put into reserve. Uh, before she goes quite in reserve, though, after the review... Um, the King Edward VII goes on a tour westwards along the coast, and Crescent is the escort ship. Again, Edgar class used as the escort. First World War, she takes part in as an active role and does her duties. She's a good ship. So, summary. This were a good class. 
these were a good ship. Time war came, they weren't able to do the role which they'd been envisaged doing of being a scout for the fleet or that kind of heavy muscle. But they were certainly still capable of dealing with interdicting commerce raiders and commerce protection. And they were certainly proved very useful in shore bombardment and other auxiliary operations around the world. And that is a lesson we should perhaps remember again and again for history. From history, for history, and for current days. A ship doesn't have to be first rate to be of use. You can't get much done in a war unless you have a core of first rate ships to fight your battles and lead your task groups and do the duties you need of them. And first rate these days means new and up to date and all singing, all dancing vessels. But, and I say this in all seriousness, you are never going to have the number of ships you need to do all the operations you need to do if you insist on every single ship being top of the range. So therefore, there has to be a point at which you go, is a ship still practicable? I, is, am I able to still use it for certain duties? And do those duties make it worthwhile keeping in reserve? The Edgar class spent most of their careers in reserve. This didn't mean they weren't useful when war came. In fact, the opposite. It meant their engines and everything were capable of being used very harshly. There were vessels of their class which were in service at various points and provide a very core service and very core use in the 1900s and the 1890s. But by the 1910s, hmm, they weren't first rate anymore. But they were still useful. It was still a value. So, two questions. The most naval name you could think of, how and what name could you give a, give a baby to preordain it would have to join a naval service and which naval service was that bit preordained for? Second question, E-class cruisers. In the 1920s, when you're naming those in the late 1910s, early 1920s, and you've got two E-class, you're building, the, you suddenly get the funding from the Treasury going, look, oh, the Washington Treaty has a limited number of total tonnage of cruisers. Let's build a load of E-class cruisers, really perk up our Navy. So, yes, build them. What should we call them? What should we call, oh, we'll call them, and what should they be? And there'll be a match number of them to D class. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And I'm going to apologize now if yesterday's video was a little late going up. I'm not sure if it's even completed the upload yet. And it's been going the entire time I've been recording this. And before then. The internet here is incredibly slow. And I will upload this hopefully while well, I will start uploading. After I've finished recording. And hopefully get it uploaded. But um. If I don't, the videos might be running a day behind, in which case I apologize. Take care, have fun, and lies we got coming up. Well, luckily, on the 16th of September, I'm in somewhere with good Wi-Fi. And on the 18th, I'm in somewhere with great Wi-Fi, hopefully. And then we ha we're back to normal. For October, back to normal. And then November, I might be wandering again, but we'll see. Depends on funding if I'm going to that research trip. And also depends on whether I've... Uh, basically, when I say it depends on funding, it depends on how much money I have and how much money I've spent on a computer. Because, <laughs> of course, when I get back, I'm building my new PC. So I can do, hopefully, better videos and better quality sound production for you all. Take care, everyone. Have fun. Bye.